Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming out on this uh, cold Saturday <laughs> afternoon to... It is Saturday, isn't it? Yeah, all, to, uh, day. all day. Yeah, to, uh, to have a conversation with, uh, with the artist uh, uh, James Lee Duffy. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to start off asking you specific questions about the, the work that you've got uh, mm -hmm. here and then maybe we'll sort of broaden it out and then maybe uh, as, the, uh, as the hours tick by uh, I'll ask you to uh, ask, uh, uh, make some contributions to the, uh, to the debate. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to get some, uh, I'm hoping to get something uh, uh, interesting and possibly scandalous from uh, uh, well, Mr. Duffy, but it, it we both have size twelve feet. So that's a good start. <laughs> we could put them both <laughs> in, in the wrong place. Yeah. So, James. So, first of all, could we uh, could could you uh, could you talk us through your 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 piece that you're uh, showing here? Sure. Uh, here. It's a collection of nine pieces, um, which are heavily rooted in nostalgia. So, all my work comes from a place in my childhood. I mean, I had a very happy childhood. There's no dark, deep secrets in there at all. Um, the collection's called Pause, Play and Rewind. And this is kind of the way my brain works when I come and think about ideas of nostalgia in my childhood and memories, how they fade into play. They come into your imagination and to your mind's eye, so to speak. And these are like almost like TV and video frames of my childhood, essentially, which I've uh, brought to life. So each one's got a story behind it. Each one is... Nothing too sinister, um, but I use the black as a very kind of you can't you can't hide behind it. I think when I start use color and things like that, it's almost like you can uh, hide from your mistakes. It's almost the the color becomes something far more than actually what the image is about, and it detracts. So the rawness of using the mixed materials of paint and oil pastel and charcoal and and um, waterproof inks is quite raw. Mm. Um, but comes a very playful place, mm. you know, some pieces there. So uh, the six work, there's no I imagination behind, there's no like kind of science behind the numbers of nine. It just mm. sort of felt they sitted right, they felt right, they felt in that formation, they worked really well. Um, and each piece has got uh, something, as I said, linked to my child where it's come from. So there's a piece there like the alley cats when I got bitten by a cat in a alley <laughs> essentially but it was such a big deal I must have been about five years old when I got bitten by this stray cat mm. and my mum scrubbed it with a scrubbing brush and sort of threw me back outside and told me to get on with it mm. um, and then there's other pieces there which is um, I can't remember the names off the top of my head but some pieces quite abstract there which is kind of imagination of seeing loads of punk rockers when I was in the push chair mm. and being transfixed by their clothes Seeing and them. identity yeah. Oh, okay. yeah no it's like early 80s hmm. so it's that, that turning point of punk culture where it's all very mohicans and spray paint and over dramatized kind of the punk idea of what punk was hmm. when the daily mail got hold of it probably hmm. um it's so those vivid imaginations are still so strong in my mind hmm. you know um yeah i mean i can talk more and more about it as each piece but it depends where you want to go really the way the way I the way I've read it uh, myself is is as a uh, uh, as a comic strip. It seems to go. Yeah. It seems to move from one and 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 it seems anyway. It seems also that that's your aesthetic. That Very much so. That's yeah. a really interesting point. And it's also like animation styles as well, right? Mm. So maybe there is a reason why they're in set of nine, and it mm. is like a comic strip. Mm. And subconsciously, that came into play, mm. um, which I really like that idea. I think to your point, my work is very much taken in by caricatures and cartoon mm. and mm. Uh, that culture um, and I do my twist and my turn on it to make it more ownable to me and it's because of my very animated style and way I work mm. it's uh, it works really well together mm. what's uh, what's puzzling though is that the uh, what's puzzling is that there is a there is definitely an obs obscurity about the work there's definitely an obscure an obscuring activity going on mm. that you that there are there are clearly uh, there are cl clearly images which are coming up and then being covered over or being drawn over and then being repeated elsewhere mm -hmm. so it's like um, so the idea of it being a direct communication uh, uh, 
uh, I, I think that gives the lie to the idea of it, it, it being a direct communication. It's not, it's not directly saying. I, I can't look at alley cats, for example, mm. and get everything that you've just said about That's it, right. alley cats, can I? I don't, no, I'm, not at all. Unless you really know the story behind it, yeah. you won't get it at all. Yeah. And if you do know a story behind it, you probably say I won't get it anyway. Yeah. I think the way, like for example, do I do those test works? Do I sit there and work endlessly on pieces mm. before I get the final piece? No. Mm. I have an emotion and a feeling with my work, mm. which is very instant. Mm. Like for example, that body of work probably took me four months to think about. Mm. And then I didn't write any ideas down. I literally then went to my studio and go, right, now ready to create. I created the pieces spontaneously. Mm. And then where it's almost like rubbing out pieces is where my brain's just, I'm trying to keep up with my thoughts. Mm. So the thoughts are happening so vividly and so fast. And I've probably had these thoughts for years, mm. but they're like deep under my consciousness and they come to the top. And it's, like a, it's almost like a boiling pot mm. where it's almost like boiling over. Mm. Like I did a number of pieces to, before I get to the final one. So it's almost like a, almost like in a trance where mm. you're completely getting carried away and you kind of like, I'm trying to keep up with my own self and my own thoughts. Mm. So are the other are the pieces that you're, you're doing to get to that point, uh, how, 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 how do you value them? Where, where, where does the... Nothing really gets thrown away. Ah. I hang on to everything. I mean, mm. I'm eclectic by, mm. by personality, so I, I collect and hang on to things. I, mm. I find it very difficult to let go of stuff. Mm. And whenever I have got this stuff, I've regretted it spontaneously, like instantly mm -hmm. regretted it. So it, it, I find it very difficult to let go of stuff. Um, I don't know why. Mm. Um, but I always hang on to everything, even even the rough kits, even the piece of paper I use to make marks, I hang on to into a, into a, in a box. I still see the beauty in those pieces by themselves anyway. Mm. Um, so, and it's and it's to your point, it's quite difficult to put a value on all of that, isn't it? Mm. You know, because it all can be seen as I suppose it's that for me it's that instinct and that that kind of deep rooted like spontaneous like I like it mm. <laughs> just, just, just it works immediate yeah and I think that comes mm. with my skill set as an art director over mm. the years you get a spontaneous kind of liking to something and you sure. go it's right or wrong if I change it anymore then it's just going to lose what you're out mm. going out to actually kind of make a mark onto it and do you see that entirely as as a uh, do you see that entirely as a sort of instinctual thing yeah. Uh, I suppose in, to a certain degree, yes, but I think with, with time and skill and observation, you take certain things on board, don't you? So yeah. I think it's probably come down to experience, mm. you know. So experience, but not, not maybe not ar an articulated experience. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I come from, I don't come from actual real training as an artist in that context. I haven't, I went to art school for two years and, you know, it, it teaches you to draw and paint to a certain degree. Mm. I did graphic design, so mm. I didn't do fine art or anything like that. So I come from a very unorthodox approach. Yeah. yeah. And so do you, are you, uh, do, you do, do you think you, do, do you place your work in a, in what you've, Kind of loosely call a fine art context. W would you would you say that's what it is? I mean, are you? I yeah. I don't think I'll break it down in so simple as mm, that. Mm. I think it can sit. It can sit. It can quite easily hold its own in that environment. Hundred mm, percent. Surely. But it can sit. It can kind of sit anywhere. Yeah. You know, and that's the beautiful about the show is the sheer diversity of the work. Yeah. Um, as a whole, not just mine, but yeah, I mean. Look at the collectors who people buy my work, for example, they come from very different backgrounds. Like mm. one person has a connection to a particular character and he's bought straight into it in the first piece of work oh, he's right, ever right. bought. Yeah. Or I've got uh. people who are art dealers who actually love it for the pure energy and the graphic and the, the vibrancy and the kind of layers to it mm. from a fine art point of view. Mm. So mm. It, it can lend itself to quite different environments quite happily. Mm. And this, this, this sort of activity, I mean, this is a... Uh, the, kind of what you're describing the picture you're painting is is somebody uh, who is kind of in the studio all the time making 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 is that is that is that a yeah very much so yeah yeah, more so that's, yeah. and that, that so that is clearly something which has developed I don't know is, it, it's not how life has always been is it I mean that's not how you've how you've that's not your career so no, far. but my career is very much same same mindset. Ah. You know, the same approach. You know, with, with twenty five years of working as graphic designer and art director and creative director, and mm. I was still even working on full time clients. I was working on my own stuff mm. um, over street art in the in the nineties under Orco. <laughs> but um, mm. like even it, up to now, I've always been doing something 
on the side, paving liquor with the art scene, things like that. I've always had mm. projects on the go, or art projects on the go, or exhibitions or something happening. Mm. Not so much in this drill down style. This is something mm -hmm. which has definitely kind of come to a point now where I feel very comfortable sure. being my main focus, so to speak. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, it's kind of non collaborative as well, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, it's kind of just you. Yeah, I have done some collective pieces with uh, artists in the last year, Marcus James, we worked mm. some pieces. He came from a very fine art background. He studied at the Royal Academy, he studied at St. Martin's. His work is very much about nature or about um, humanity or uh, sex. And he does very fine, tiny, we we'll spend hours and hours and hours on a piece. And the work we did, he gave me all his work, which probably a year's worth of work. Mm. And I went, painted all over the top of it. Oh, okay. Literally in seconds. Yeah. Um, so it was Destroy to Create was the title. So there's a part where I do can work quite happily with other people, depending on. Mm. There's, a, there's a show we're working on together, actually, with Daryl, who's in the audience. We've got a show coming up at the end of the year in Faversham, actually, which we're going to do some collective stuff together as well. Right. So I can lend myself mm. quite happily when working with other and, people. And, and when you do these projects, are they, are they the things that you've... Uh, are, they, are they things that um, develop as you go along, or are they, are they things that you have in your mind straight away? Or Lots of things are always things bubbling work. away. Yeah. So I mean, I don't have loads and loads of sketchbooks with loads and loads of drawings and loads mm. of work in. It's something which is just, it's a lot of it, most of it's in my head. Or mm. I just write lists down on my phone, almost as like titles. And then sure. from that title, it's all the ideas are kind of heavily based on. Sure. Because I mean, in a way you could say the whole thing is like a big sketchbook, isn't it? You're, yeah. You're, you're kind of churning ideas out and you choose you, you get to a certain point and that's the one you do, but then you've got all this other stuff, which is your collection. Yes. Is, I mean, that's... Yes, it's almost, it's a like refined sketchbook. Yeah. It's definitely kind well, of... Well, sketchbook, sketchbook is a really... Collection? Yeah, archive. Archive, I like archive, it's good. Yeah. Oh God. yeah. I've got hundreds of sketchbooks, and I never look at one of them, uh, and I've spent... They're such beautiful things, aren't they? I spent years telling students how important it is to, uh, you know, do sketches every day and draw and stuff, and uh, and I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> which is, which is, there is a true, true teacher spoken, right? Yeah. Which is often a way. I've got, but I've got all these things, and they're all in my, uh, they're all in my studio, and there is, it, it's, it's like I could at any point uh, turn around and get one out and look at it while I'm painting. Just, no. What, Bit sad, really, but you're uh, getting back to you. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in in a way, what you're doing is uh, in a way, what you're doing is making a kind of massive sketchbook. In a way, what you're doing is making your whole life is a yeah. your whole work is this sort of massive sketchbook that yeah, it kind is. of flows on and on. I think and on. it. I mean, that lines itself as well with all my design work over the years. You know, yeah. you know, I don't do corporate design. I've yeah. never done corporate work or I don't know enough about work. The design. Uh, I don't know enough about that about that world to be able to to, to, be able to ask you any you know reasonable questions. But, it's but I would have thought that what you're doing is you're making is you're heading towards uh, uh, you're heading towards projects where there will be an image and there will be a a a brand will come out of it and that will be the brand. But you're but what you're talking about is a to is an act a total activity that it is. yes. It's yes, a, yes, it's yes. It's a total life activity yes. that goes on all the time. Absolutely. So, in in your creative director world, you are working to to discrete projects, aren't you? Yes, you are. And I think the difference between a graphic designer and an artist is that a graphic designer needs a brief yeah. to work to, and an artist doesn't. And that's yeah. that spoils why my work now is taking. It's, it's such almost like a hurricane. I'm doing so yeah. much of it yeah. that it's getting not out of control, but it's mm. kind of happily ploughing around. Yeah. So. Uh, so there's like this kind of a sense, really, of 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 your work being um, your your kind of current work being a a, a, a release or, or something that's been released. It's from definitely the, a release. The agony of having to. It's definitely a release. What some yeah, absolutely. Toilet paper manufacturer. Hundred percent. We don't yeah. talk about that, Charles. So. That's <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, that, I mean, that's a classic, yeah. that's a classic that is. thing, isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and the graphic designers that I've known, well, I, was quite, I, was, I had a very good friend who was a graphic designer, and, and, he, and he, his thing was, he, 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 said, uh, he said, I just, I just hate clients. Yeah. 
and that and you know which I think is madness because they're the people who are paying you the money yeah. but but that is the that's the you that's the them. thing isn't it yeah it really is and that's that's a beauty I think more so right now that I haven't got a client yeah. apart from the commissions obviously which is something yeah, else yeah, but yeah. is that freedom it's complete freedom yeah the thing that's what it is it's complete freedom that's probably comes across in my way to work because it's a sense of freedom as yeah, well and in, in, in a way there's also a sense that in, in, in a way there's a sense of you reveling in that because as mm. I said there's a massive obscurantism about your work in the sense mm -hmm. you know you are purposefully not you know you're sort of telling a story but you're covering it up at the same time yes. you're not actually saying not making it so simple for yeah. the for viewer to, to yeah. understand almost. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a, so, so a, a, a sort of, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the late 80s, 90s, the, 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 the world of fine art, which you're now moving in, that, that kind of pivoted away from, uh, uh, individualism and, and became became interested in the messages we're we're transmitting. Mm -hmm. It became, you know, the, the the biggest collector at the time uh, was Charles Saatchi, who was an advertising mm -hmm. person. So art became a thing about yes. about making a uh, a, a, message. a statement, a yeah. message, a, a thing. Um, you're, it seems to me you're kind of you're taking that and twisting it back Pain over it. again. Yeah, very much so. Mm. I mean, and also, especially, there are some similarities to the characters I do mm. portray and come mm, across, mm. And, ca and there's characteristics which I use, mm. and there's certain imagery and things which I reference points I come to. Mm. Definitely. Mm. It definitely comes from very much of saying a message and telling a story. Mm. Very much so. It's, it's, uh, to me, what it looks like, to me, what it looks like is so, so, somebody kind of, uh, somebody somebody frustrated with the idea of telling stories or having to tell stories it's, that's interesting it's like it's like somebody you know uh pushing pushing away at that yeah it's pretty pushing it's, it's away friction mm. having to make things so black and white in mm. that traditional sense of make, telling a story mm. yes and but i like i like the fact there's layers behind it mm. so people don't quite know yeah you know and they also make them they can lead to their own story behind it to a certain degree. It must be a cliche that, but mm. it's, it's it's allowing the allowing the viewer to be more pulled in by it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you could sort of move into the into thinking about the materials because uh, 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 one of the things that I've noticed about the the, the kind of materials you use is, is that they are uh, I wouldn't use the word domestic, but they're they're sort of they're everyday materials, aren't they? Yeah. You're, you're definitely not using, um, uh, you know, high prestige materials, and you're and you're um, and you're sticking to a scale. I don't think no, I've seen scale. much. No massive. big stuff. I do massive. How, how, not how, quite big as Peru's, but right. I mean, I'm two meters by three meters, three meters by two meters on a big piece of paper, paper and canvas. Mm. And they're most of them sold mm. like big pieces. They're mostly in the gallery in Rye. Mm. Um, and then commission pieces are sort of I'm working on commission which is double that size at the moment mm. um, for a private buyer um, the materials you know when I first started I used to make I didn't use brushes I was like I'm not going to use brushes I'm going to re rebel that I want to make my own I want to use sticks or use broken marker pens or bits of bits of uh, cardboard or a toothbrush or anything to make a mark which wasn't conventional mm. and that's kind of stayed with like a lot of some of those pieces we've done is like that we use with an egg, egg, egg box carton oh, right. torn apart right. yeah you know um or if i get a brush i tend to cut the tops off mm. so it's more of a sprayed yeah, yeah, yeah. vessel um a lot of oil pastels so expensive ones from atlantis not the ones mm. from around the corner right um you know, and but I I I, I, destro I destroyed them in seconds because mm. I'm so so violent with some of those markings that it just breaks down the. And then I use a lot of waterproof inks and some uh, enamel paints I've started to use as well. Right. Ah. Okay. Enamel paints. Yeah. Right. So you're gonna you're gonna start getting um gonna get you start gonna get more interested in the in the 
the surface that you're yeah you're the texture because yeah. yeah. the pieces in there you still got a heavy texture to them as well mm. because of those layers and because of the process mm. and so because they're so animated I want those to all have a 3D approach you know mm. some of some of the things are probably dropping off and falling inside the frame itself sorry <laughs> um, it's 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 part of for me it's part of telling that that story mm. you know because <laughs> The idea that they're falling off constantly is quite nice as well, that they won't always be here. Because they are fragmented media. memory. So yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, it, it, yeah. it's in that layering, going back to a layering, is because it's, it's, it's fragmented memory. So they do start disintegrating. They're coming apart, they're falling apart. There's mm. layers to our memories, isn't it? Mm, mm, mm. You know? Right, okay. And uh, right. also, a lot of the things you're talking about are, are, are uh, that's direct, isn't it? I mean, that's. It's, a, it's as direct as possible. Yes. Is, is what you're talking about. Very much. It's, it, if you're going to use a brush, you're going to cut the tuft off. So yeah, be quite just, bold of you're, it. You're pushing the stuff around. Yeah. Rather than. It's the same as my handwriting. If you uh, give me a biro, my writing's terrible, mm. absolutely horrendous. But you give me a big marker pen, and mm. my work can be used, and it's used across billboards and things mm. like that. Mm. It, it's got its own life to it. I need to be, I'm a big guy, I need to make big, big statements. Mm. I can't do. Small detailed work. Mm, mm. Now doing FX kids uh, as a as a FX as a kid was a nightmare. Mm. Some big yeah, blob of newspaper. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Disaster. Yeah. Mm. That is that is a that is a a problem. You you, you haven't been uh, drawn to, uh, to to making three D to making sculpture or the the or actual. 3D stuff. Yes, I started looking at because obviously I collect toys. I've got a huge mm. toy collection. And I started looking down that route of doing collectible figures, mm. um, which is on pause. But then potentially looking at bronzes. But then there's talk of doing ceramics. Mm. So definitely want to go. Definitely want to explore that. Mm. I mean, at the moment, it's it's super exciting for me because I feel like a teenager. It's almost I'm starting my career again. Mm. Mm. So for me, I'm open to anything which can tell a story for me mm. do you think you're do, do you think do you, everything you've said about how you make your your work and and and, and the ideas behind it, it, it everything is related to your childhood yeah isn't it i mean Very much. and everything is everything is connected to to a kind of child experience it is yeah very much so and uh my childhood obsessions you know mm. of collecting toys and being that's it, fascinated by comics and animation and mm -hmm. black and white TV. We didn't have colour TV until late, so everyone mm. was in black and white. Um, and it's just hours spent looking at these these form and playing with the figures and the characters and, you know, my imagination was wild as a kid and I had mm. the freedom to play in the wasteland for hours, <laughs> making camps and probably sh shoot mm. my brother in the leg with an air rifle, no doubt. Probably mm. not quite as extreme as that, but mm -hmm. you know, is it? I was very, very a lot of freedom, a lot of imagination. And I think I've always had that. I've always hung on to that. Yeah. So you're, so you're, um, uh, yeah. So then you go into, so then you go into a world of, uh, then you go into a world uh, of quite, uh, quite a lot of restrictions. Really, I mean, you go into you, you go and do graphic design, which is like the least yeah creative but yeah. then but yeah, it was but then what got me to graphic design was jamie reed ah, and okay, yeah. sure. you know the punk sure. movement and yeah. devo and dada and all the mm. more rebellious side to you, graphic design you, you you started an apprenticeship i think i did i went to art school and then uh no fucking so oh sorry it's kids there's uh no son of mine is going to university ah uh, right yeah so i had to go and get an apprenticeship Right. Which, you know, okay. turning up at a repro house wearing tartan trousers, a crop top and spiky hair right. at 19. Well, I've got gaffer tape to a chair left out in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to make Good. tea by pan uh, Pantone reference, you know, 10 cups of tea, different paint swatches. Really? Yeah. And it used to be working at my desk and people were throwing scalpels at me. <laughs> like this. <laughs> Doing -wing -wing. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's part of your apprenticeship in the, in a, what is a repro house? It's where everything goes to be printed. So right. if it leaves the uh, design graphic designer, sends their artwork to a house to make printing plates or they used to shoot it by camera then. So it's mm. made black and white paste, paste up before the Apple Macs really took over. Right, all so right, okay. It's like the boring side, really. Of right, 
yeah. of graphic design. Uh, and how long did you last in that? Two and a half years. Right. Did you learn? I learned an awful lot. Mm. I knew how to dodge scalpels. I knew mm. how to make tea. And how to get out of... And how to get <laughs> been gaffer taped to your chair. Um, no, I did learn an awful lot. Ah. But, but that's because, you know, the way I've worked my career and still working now, I can... I've done everything from a concept all the way through to final print, so... Mm. So how, did you, so how did you go from how did you go from Repro House to Repro House? I was like up yours. I'm going to Australia for a year. Oh, okay. Went to Australia. Turned up no portfolio. Lied to get into work placements. Yeah. Got a work placement. Proved myself. Mm. Worked for a couple of fashion houses out there. A couple of fashion magazines. Mm -hmm. Came back. Worked for GQ. So how long are you in Australia? A year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Worked for GQ at Vogue House for six months. And then I worked for a design agency in Farringdon, working on Lego. And then I got headhunted and worked at an agency called Cake, who uh, groundbreaking guerrilla marketing agency. He mm. worked for Rizzler. We worked for. Uh, so w when are we now? Two, uh, nine, uh, 2000. 2000, okay. 2000. Right. And then we worked for Nintendo, Reebok, Budweiser, Carling. Uh, we worked with Banksy. We worked with some of the biggest guerrilla marketing stunts in the UK, for example. Mm. It's very rock and roll. Mm. It's very Nathan Barley. I bet my, I bet my mess, best mate who was cycling around the offices on a BMX with an American football helmet. And that's how we started up Pavement Liquor, which mm. is the art scene I've done and still right. do. Right. And then I carried on working as a creative director and ran agencies in Shoreditch and design agencies and continued to do all my own personal work mm. and had exhibitions in Tokyo, New York. Um, we used to do a lot of street stuff. And the same, so the same sort of, the same work you're exhibiting, the work, the sort of work that you're doing now would be recognisably the same sort of thing you were exhibiting in. To Tokyo. a certain degree, yeah. I mean, very character driven, but a lot more mm. garish colours. Mm. Dare I say, more tribal in style. Mm. Um, mm. A lot more uh, street art focus. When it was at the start of street art, really, so it was like two thousand and one, East London mm. kind of approach to it. That makes sense. It's probably a bit vague, but I think. Do you know the artist Phil Frost or uh, Harring, Keith Harring? Mm. Oh yeah, Basquiat. Right. Mm. That world. Mm. We still you can see the, how it leads itself to my work now. It's mm. very much those Surely, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the artist Futura. That kind yeah. of his big pointy figures. Ab absolutely, yeah. And, but that's that's part of a. And I I remember that being. I remember that sort of coming up where, um, when when I was in a. I was in a. Uh, a group of artists called the Stuckists, but we we exhibited on uh, Leonard Street. Yeah, right. And I yeah. think I think the the premises we we that was the gallery yeah. was taken over by I think Pure Evil. Yeah, no. possibly. Yeah, no, Pure Evil. Um, Did a book and that, that last was month. What was all happening then? Yeah, that, that was yeah, quite right. Clearly, the thing. Yeah, that very was, much. Uh, I mean, Charlie's still going now. He's staying strong. Yeah, he's got two galleries on Leonard yeah. Street now. And that and that was the world that you were involved with heavily. You, right. So we've just, I've just published a book, self-published book, Josh and I, who I do paint mm. liquor with. Mm. We've just done a book about a dragon bar, mm. which was on Leonard Street, yeah, which yeah. was where Banksy had his studio upstairs. Mm. And we launched it at Charlie's Gallery last month. Oh, but right. it's, it's a book essentially about the start of street art in the UK. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've interviewed with Fay, um, Fail and um, Banksy and mm. everyone else who needs to be. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, were you uh, were, were you tagging things or were you were you I was doing more murals? Paste or? Up. I was oh, okay. more paste up in stickers, and at the time, right. you go to the river post office and get you know those Royal Mail, like uh, first class and signed for. Mm. You used to be able to get them for free, right? You could just help yourself to them. So it was a platform, and it's free stick. Well, free stickering. You could right. take those, do your do your piece on there, and stick them up around right. town, right? Or in oh. various places, or public toilets, or. Bar yeah. toilets or yeah, yeah, yeah. any other lovely places you hang out in. Yeah, so you were doing, you were making stickers, and you were, w were you doing posters? A wheat paste, yeah, wheat paste. Yeah. So you would. Uh, so you dash along and post. That's exactly it. Yeah. Wallpaper paste, a bucket, and a yeah, and a roller. Interesting. This enough. is this is before internet though, so yeah, of course, yeah, you know, yeah. We're getting your work out there because no gallery would have us. Is, is that how you think about it then? Is that you're getting your work out there? Yeah, very much so. Ah. By all means possible. Yeah, definitely. Because, uh, because really, what's going on is your. I mean, the tagging thing is mm. is is your you're going around. 
sticking, you know, you're kind of, it's, it's, you're sort of marking territory, aren't you? You're, you're, you are. You're, you're, you're sort of peeing on yeah, the corner. Yeah, it's like urban fox. Yeah. And then there are rules, aren't they? So you can't tag over other people, or you do tag over other they people. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's a, different layers, you know, there's different yeah. forms of vandalism and graffiti and street art. Yeah. The, you know, when you go and delve into the graffiti world, then that's a whole other territory. Oh, right. So, you, so you, you're, you're we were frowned upon. Graffiti. We weren't purists. Mm. We were more of a Ill frustrated artists and illustrators who want to get our work out there, I guess. Right. Okay. That's right. why there's so much. It's not like now where you walk down the street and there's big murals and mm. you know, there's work everywhere. Uh, in, in these cities? It's in the UK generally. Yeah. Now, you know, at the time of 90s, there's only real pockets like parts of East London. Mm. Apart from the train lines, which the purest graffiti writers were doing. Mm. There's only small pockets where artists really start putting their work out there. Brighton had a few, Bristol obviously had a few, mm. London especially, to name a few. Mm. So that, that uh, well, I'm just thinking about the, uh, the graffiti thing as a, or, the, or, or the stickering thing, mm. I mean, uh, uh, as, a, as an activity. It is, it, it, it is a sort of way of, of, of pushing, push, putting your identity out, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a way of... It's a way of um, it's a, it's a way of saying I was here or I very am much so here. yeah um, and and also I suppose because it was before the internet and social media there's no mm. means of getting your work out there unless mm. you get it published and getting your work published was almost impossible mm. unless you knew the right people mm. so you had to get your work out somehow mm. there's certain places like with Dragon World where you could write literally draw all over the walls and then encourage that. Mm. But there, and there'll be pub publications as well, your zines yeah. and things. Yeah, 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 that's, absolutely. That's all, that's all happening at the same sort yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's right. exactly it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons why we set up the Zine Paint Liquors as a platform for people's work to be published because it wasn't being published and there's mm. no way of getting work published, really. Because mm. um, also, it was still a snobbery around that sort of work. Mm. You know, the art world is very snobbish, as we know. It's mellowed in a certain degree, but... It's very difficult to really get yourself seen or heard, mm. or even to be in a building like here. You know, it's very difficult. H how do you mean? In, in, in what way is it uh, snobbish, or uh, well, I mean, and how is it difficult? I suppose it's being one being noticed, and two knowing the right people in the right avenue to get your work in. Mm. You know, and the opportunities mm. to come about to get your work in for the average Joe. Right. Right. Okay, but uh, but there's a different way of looking at it, which is is that your uh, your whole kind of business, and, and this is what I found this is what I found fascinating about how you deal with things is that your whole business is about how to attract people's attention, mm -hmm. isn't it? I mean, you're, yeah. you're you're from that's that's the whole point of being a graphic designer yeah, 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 or absolutely. a creative director. Your whole business is about how to attract people's attention and that is how you that is kind of how you're approaching making your work yeah absolutely that you that you're you know and so you've it's almost like you I mean in no I, I don't mean you know I don't mean this in any this in no pejorative sense but it's almost like you've established that there is a market and so then you then you do something with the market that's, to be honest that's what artists have always done yeah there is definitely uh, I think it just so happens what I've always done has now come the trend. Uh, yeah, I think it's something right. which you know, the artists I've collected for the years, no one collected them. Yeah, you know, twenty five years ago when I started buying their work, mm. and now they're like some of the biggest artists in the world, selling artists, mm -hmm. artists in the world, artists like Cause, for example. Just so happens that 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 spiraling trend has now come to a point where it's more seen and more popular, I guess. Mm. Mm. But the other side is I've obviously got a, an eye for it and a flavour for it, so I've kind of got a sense for it, so naturally my work's going to evolve in that context. Mm. But then, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, so h how do you evolve then? I mean, do, is it just like do more collaboration, make it bigger? I think it's being curious, isn't it? Mm. I think, you know, there's so much to be inspired by, so much things to be picked up on and taken on. Mm. I think that's part of the driving force and no, no means am I copying anyone's work. Mm. It's almost 
you just take parts of it and you just push. But it's almost, it's kind of a, a, an irrelevance that, that it doesn't sort of mean anything, does it? Copying? No, no. And even appropriating doesn't really mean anything. No. It's just that you are, you kind of. A vibration. It's all these sort of tendrils that yeah, go out yeah, yeah. and it, you, you, you pick up on things. And Absolutely. And that, the people that, you're picking up on things pick up on things. And that might be, you know, the, the art director side of me. Yeah. You know? Sure. Borrow and steal and to yeah, make yeah. your own. Yeah. You know, it's like that's, and then, you know, I'm a collector. I collect art. I collect, I collect toys. I collect clothes. I collect everything. Tell me a bit more about the book that you've just published then, the, uh, so, the Dragon Bar book. So, Josh and I, Josh, who I do Pave and Liquor with, and have done, we started it 20 years ago. Josh is the editor of Huck Magazine, the Sandwich Magazine, and has been done independent magazines his entire life. An amazing writer and editor, um, and an extremely funny guy. I used to drink in the Dragon Bar when I was stickering and mm. a lot skinnier than I am now. Oh my God, 1998, 99, right. when I first moved to Hackney yeah. from Australia. Um, and there's a bar top end of Leonard Street, and it was on four floors. And it looked like a classic kind of New York dive bar. Mm. When you go in, I used to go there a lot of all my friends. We started to know all the artists, like Paul Insect used to drink there, Banksy used to drink there, uh, Pure Evil used to drink there, Fail used to drink there, Chaplin Brothers used to drink there, Barry Rygate used to drink there, Mo 2 used to drink there. I mean, the list is endless of contemporary artists. Tracy Emin used to drink there, Gavin, um, uh, Gavin Turk used to drink there. Lots of uh, pieces of artwork in the bar itself. They used to have a gallery upstairs. Um, and if they liked your work, they would exhibit it for free. Um, and then there's an apartment upstairs and the ground floor, which was part of the bar, and then a massive courtyard out the back. And over the years, it came the place where everyone used to hang out. I mean, there's a time of East London where it was like dead. Mm. You, you didn't go there. Mm. There's no man's land. A place. Yeah, you couldn't get a black cab. It was impossible mm. you had to walk home most of the time. Um, as a place where people would hang out and felt safe and were allowed to draw on the walls and go up to mischief and if they wanted to play music and a band play, they played until five in the morning with a mm. lock-in, no problems at all. And then out the back was a huge courtyard which got covered in graffiti, they used to have graffiti jams, there'd be live music performances, there'd be spoken word, there'd be film performances, there'd be performance pieces upstairs, there'd be Banksy studio was on upstairs, so was a guy called JJ, who was a guy called Noki, who's a stylist, he was worked for Days Confused. Okay. All the magazines used to work there, um, used to drink in there, sorry. Um, and it's a, it a fantastic, exciting place. Mm. A lot of people, like there'd be a thing called Technology, which is a, a hip hop collective at the time, and a guy called Burn. And at the time, he used to be an amazing MC, and in, him and I used to talk, and he's like, you know what, I really wanted to be an actor. I really want to go into acting, and now he's like in Hollywood films, he's a famous actor. Um, some of the guys in Mission Chefs, Star Chefs on there, a lot of people are very famous, like Banksy, famous artists. Um, some people have obviously fallen by the wayside through drinking drugs, but it was a huge melting pot. So I had an idea with Josh, I said, no one's done a book about Dragon Ball, we should do it. So mm. three years ago this was, and we started um, looking into it, got in touch with Justin who owns it. He said, go ahead, give me my blessings, whatever you need, let me know. So. It's still, it's not extant. It, uh, it, it, it closed in, uh, mysteriously closed in 2008 mm. with a fire. Oh, right. Which basically was, uh, the council got paid off and property developers got in oh, and okay. set a light to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it disappeared and now it's luxury flats. Right. Um, but it was a, it was a massive uh, jigsaw puzzle of getting all the photos because no mm. one had cameras, no one had no oh, social phone. media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one photo of someone with a flip phone. That was it. Right. So trying to get photos and trying to get interviews and get people to remember exactly what had gone on those nights. Mm. You know, to get the stories was quite a challenge. So, mm. but it's been published. Right. So how did you? What have you got then? What 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 visual? What visual? Uh, we managed to find Justin and managed yeah. to find in his loft. He had a massive archive of photos oh, okay. of which he got printed. And then we found this guy who used to work. They had the hard drive and stuff. Mm. And we, we pasted it all together, like we've got photos of Banksy's first London show, wow. which these photos haven't been seen mm. by anyone, including by his agent, Laz, at the time. Um, so we've pasted it all together, and now it should be available in rough trade and urban outfitters and wonderful establishments like that. Wow, brilliant. Globally. Yeah, fantastic. And, that, yeah. and, and you, that'll be like a, that's a, an establishing kind of 
publication, isn't it? That's yeah. You, yeah, you, it's, it's 300 pages of yeah. hardback book. Blimey. Um, and some stuff in there no one's ever seen. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it was such a period of time where there was like graffiti was graffiti and then street art came into play and that's why it was kind of a start of it. It was a, mm. one of the birthplaces, like, I always say it's wrong, CBB, CGB's in oh, New yeah, York. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Was a kind of a start of, yeah, of let's course. say, punk rock to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a start of street art in that sense. Yeah. It's so funny, it's, isn't it? Because that, it would have been that that is what everybody would now associate with that part of London and of course it's gone yeah it's all gone so the whole yeah it's the all whole, gone the whole thing of, yeah. of that area of London yeah well it's just classic isn't it estate age, artists move in and the yeah. estate agents move in yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah, that absolutely. classic play yeah well fantastic Th- thanks for that James thank um, you uh, um, now it's the point the traditional point to throw it open to the audience for questions uh, anybody got anything they'd like to ask I wonder if you understand the mindset of these people, and I wonder if anything ever positive comes out of this. You're in the context of a graffiti being used. They go, well, or why, why people put graffiti on trains? To get their work around around town. Um, <coughs> is, is it, the thing is, right, a lot of graffiti writers, yeah. the ones who do write on trains, come from a very different person to who's going to go and paint on a mural on the wall. Like, the artists you get painted up, a lot of the right ex-trained writers turned good, will now go and write on a mural down the road, but you still get the naughty boys like uh, Sweet Tooth and Tenfoot and Tox who will just write on trains. That's because what they do, that's what they like. They like the buzz, they like the thrill, they're, they're addicted to that kind of way of life. So they're naughty boys. They're little vandals and they're naughty boys who like going causing mischief. And that, I mean, I used to live one with a graffiti writer. He used to go up at three in the morning, four in the morning, or come back from pub drunk and go off and walk the train lines. Wow. And like, you know, he got arrested when he was 16. His house, he, he got broken into. He used to live up in Liverpool. He got, the police turned up at his mum and dad's door. They broke, they broke in. They battered through the door down, went through all his stuff, took all the photos. He got taken to court and was going to put away for a long time. Luckily, he didn't. That's why he moved down to London um, to escape it all because it's the wrong crowd. Mm. It's, it's, a diff- it's, it's like you know, it's like all these things. It's the same as the art world. You get different types of artists and different types of personalities and characters. But to your point, why do they write in trains to get their work up there and also the thrill and the buzz of it? So does anything positive? Well, they do because the ones who realise what they're doing will probably get a collaboration with a fashion brand or like okay, for example, there's a there's a writer called Ben Ein, Ein, who used to be a graffiti writer, well, still is to some degree. He started painting on shutters rather than trains. His work got picked up by Louis Vuitton, for example. He's got work got picked up. Um, um, his work hung up in the, in uh, by the back of armour because he knew a prime minister at the time. His name's David, um, name escapes me. But he bought a print and gave it to the back of Obama and then it was hanging in the White House which completely blew him up. Before then he was smoking crack in, in the Dragon Bar and painting on trains. And so he completely <laughs> turned his life around. So yeah, so, and there's a lot more, a lot more artists have like gone from train writing and dancing with death to sorting themselves out. And a lot of them have done a lot for, like, with group of writers I know from that time have done a lot of stuff with um, youth hostels and kids, like, kind of support and kind of uh, workshops and things like that. So there's an awful lot positive to it as well. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, any other? Um, so your work seems to be entirely focused on, or mostly focused on, your, as you say, your memories. Mm-hmm. That's quite a good question. I think it, I'd be a liar to say if it didn't. I think some of the pieces I've done, you can see the kind of mood I was in, so to speak, or temperament. Um, I do to get a certain sort of euphoric high when I'm in that work zone. It's almost like a hypnotic state, it can be. Um, it definitely helps my mood. Like if, I, if I'm pissed off, sorry kids, 
and I w will go in the studio and I will paint and it, it completely calms me down. It's almost, uh, makes me very mellow. And I think because of my, you know, I was an angst teenager, but that doesn't really come into my painting at all. It's a lot more when I'm a lot younger. And it's, it's almost you approaching the memories now rather than that's it. when they were happening. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. But it's so visual. Mm -hmm. It's so visual. I've got such a vivid memory that I can remember it all, so to speak. Well, your brain fills in the gaps, obviously, but the good bits. Got another question. That's a good point, actually. Um, no, and it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, cause it's, it's hang on to everything, right? But when, you know, people like, you buy my work, <laughs> <laughs> or when you bought my work, or I've given pieces away, or things like that, it's, it feels fantastic. So that's another thrill. Another yeah, it really is. It feels really, really humbling, but it feels ecstatic and amazing to be able to do that. And as long as I've got a photo of it, it's almost like it's, it's the next piece. Next piece. Do you have a favourite contact for your work? Oh. That's well, for context itself is obviously, it always comes from that one place anyway of nostalgia and emotion. So I think it forever changes. Do you mean where it, where it goes? Yeah, like um, in a gallery. Ah, sorry. Uh -huh. um, no, but I like people when they go to the gallery and take it home. That's kind of, that's kind of a one, isn't it? It's a so sweet your spot. context is the buyers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, design agencies or agencies as a whole are ruthless. Yeah, they are. I, I, I've never done it conventionally. Even though I've run agencies and worked at agencies, I've never gone for the big bad ones. I've always gone for ones who are a bit more interesting, a bit more rogue, a bit more genuine. Um, I mean, I wasn't happy, I'd say I wasn't happy. Like, I worked at agencies and certain clients came in, I refused to work on them. And so they kind of opened the door and let me out. <laughs> But like, yeah, I mean, a lot of them haven't got morals, but it's money at the end of the day, isn't it? And that word gets overused too much with creativity. You know, creative agency, it's not a creative agency, it's a marketing, yeah. you know, marketing house where they're churning out work more than ever before. I was there in the fun times, really. I'm showing my age now, but now it's definitely content's king and content's a hungry machine which needs to be fed. Um, you know, as soon as you step off that treadmill, it disappears. So that's your question. So. I mean, I stopped working full time at agencies about seven years ago, eight years ago. How old are you, Sylvester? You're almost eight. So, yeah, eight years ago, I kind of stepped away from agency life, so to speak. And did you do that because it just wasn't with your mental health? Uh, yeah, I mean, the hours are crazy. You know, I was doing 18 hours a day. Um, and the client didn't like blue, so I had to change your work after six months of working on it. So. <laughs> With your mental health, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, what I'm doing now is far more fulfilling. Far more fulfilling. Um, I would extend this. Do you, do you think that you wouldn't be where you are if it hadn't been for agencies? 100%. If I, I always want to be an artist, but if I'd been an artist straight from school, I wouldn't be in this position where I am now. I think with... Uh, the layers and the rich tapestry of where I've been with my career and what I've worked on and how I've gone about it, very much of a very strong opinion of how I want to be, it's definitely pushed me to now doing what I'm doing, 100%. Definitely. Definitely. What is a better way to describe your career? Were there any agencies or artists? What your best moment was so far? The golden moment when you felt... Um... Probably when I first got the job at Cake, when I was working on amazing clients and it was just mind-blowing freedom of fun. And then, was it last year when I first sold my first piece of work at the gallery? I think that's kind of 
That was that was that was an amazing. We were away in New York and we got a phone call saying that a buyer's come in and bought about five pieces. I mean, that was quite an ecstatic, euphoric moment, really. Someone I didn't know. I think that's what it was. Have you got a question, Sylvester? What's your favourite place to work? Ah, good question. Um, I think when I'm in my studio, it's my happiest place, really. I think it's surrounded by my uh, all my stuff. And I like it when you come and work with me as well. That's good fun. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Thanks Thank so you much. so much, James. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, a round of applause for James. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.